live in interesting times. Today's stories. Salvadorans hope their new president can tackle gang problem. Germany to give 5 million euros as humanitarian aid to Venezuela. Canada's Trudeau announces $53 million in aid to Venezuelans. Mexico announces search for thousands of missing people. An eyewitness recalls the car bombing in Somali market. Montargis residents explain their frustrations. The United Nations says the European Union could win big the U.S.-China trade war. Plus, the Church of Christ provides goods to impoverished and homeless individuals in Alberta. Hello everyone, I am Jennifer Polentan, bringing you stories from around the globe, and this is Eagle News, Washington, D.C. Salvadorans react the day after Najib Bukele, a former San Salvador mayor, was elected president of El Salvador, crushing a two-party system in place since civil war ended in 1992. Uno levantar la economía un país que está un poquito mal y el otro erradicar el fenómeno de las pandillas. Esos son dos pilares o dos factores importantísimos en el, en el pueblo salvadoreño. Ojalá Nayid haga algo. Y le pido a mi Dios que sea un buen presidente, que haga algo por este país y que no solo vayan a hacer promesas, que cumpla todo lo que dice. Eh, me gustaría que Bukele hiciera unos programas de reserción para las pandillas. ¿va? O sea, yo siento que las pandillas no es que ellos quieren hacerse pandilleros es por, por, porque no tienen empleo o por la falta de oportunidad que hay en el país. With Bukele's sharp beard and youthful wardrobe, jeans, leather jackets, and often a baseball cap, the 37-year-old put opponents from the country's two largest parties out of style. The Salvadoran Election Authority awarded him 53.78% of votes, with 87.67% counted, while Carlos Caleja of the right-wing Nationalist Republican Alliance won 31.62% and Hugo Martinez of the leftist Farabundo Marti Front for National Liberation took 13.77%. Bukele, a favorite in the polls throughout the campaign, ran for the small conservative Grand Alliance for National Unity, which welcomed him after he was expelled from the FMLN, a party formed by demobilized guerrilla groups. Nicknamed the Swallow after his current party's logo, Bukele, who is of Palestinian descent, first inherited affiliation to the FMLN from his family, which held clandestine guerrilla leaders during the Salvadoran Civil War. In 2012, he was elected mayor of Nuevo Castellan, a suburb of San Salvador, under the FMLN's banner. Three years later, he became mayor of the capital and stayed in that position until 2018. However, following an altercation with a municipal councillor, he was expelled from the FMLN in 2017. As he embarked on the road to the presidency, his renovation of the capital had already won the hearts of Salvadoran youth, and he proved very effective on social media. During his campaign, he targeted corruption among the old guards and proclaimed there is enough money for all San Salvadorans when nobody is stealing. But as president, he faces several great challenges, among them, the gang violence that has often ravaged El Salvador. And to address the country's issues, he will first need to form an alliance with the right-wing opposition that dominates Congress. German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas says Germany recognizes opposition figurehead Juan Guiado as Venezuela's interment president, adding that Germany will send 5 million euro in humanitarian aid to the country as soon as possible. Für Deutschland ist Juan Guaido im Einklang mit der venezolanischen Verfassung der Übergangspräsident Venezuelas mit dem Mandat, möglichst rasch freie und faire Präsidentschaftswahlen zu organisieren. Wir fordern damit die Rückkehr zur verfassungsmäßigen Ordnung und es ist jetzt an Juan Guaido, die Menschen über ihre Zukunft in Venezuela abstimmen zu lassen. Tun. Neben der Hilfe, die wir in Nachbarländern für venezolanische Geflüchtete leisten, werden wir in einem ersten Schritt zusätzlich 5 Millionen Euro für humanitäre Hilfe zur Verfügung stellen, sobald Venezuela das zulässt. 
World powers are taking sides in the deadly struggle to lead Venezuela, which has pitted some Western states against Russia, China, and others. Inside the country, 35-year-old opposition figurehead Juan Guiado is vying to lure military commanders to switch their allegiance to him and away from 56-year-old President Nicolas Maduro. Here is a summary of whom the key players are backing after Guiado, on January 23rd, declared himself acting president in defiance of the leftist Maduro. For the military, Maduro, through his allies, controls most of Venezuela's main state institutions, most importantly the military. Senior officers have reaffirmed support for him, though there have been signs of wavering. A senior Air Force general recognized Guiado as president on February 2nd. China, Venezuela's biggest creditor, with some $20 billion owed, says it opposes external interference by those who have recognized Guiado as leader. Russia, Venezuela's number two creditor, also backs its military. In December, Moscow sent two bombers and some 100 officers to Caracas for joint exercises. President Vladimir Putin has also accused the U.S. and its allies of interference in Venezuela. Other allies, Bolivia, Cuba, Iran, Mexico, North Korea, Turkey, and Uruguay, back Maduro as leader. On the other hand, U.S. President Donald Trump quickly recognized Guiado after he proclaimed himself acting president. Regional powers such as Latin American countries, including Argentina, Brazil, and Colombia, followed, as is the head of the Organization of American States, Uruguayan Luis Amalgro. European powers, namely Austria, Britain, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Latvia, Lithuania, the Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, and Sweden, recognized Guiado on Monday. Australia and Israel are among other countries to recognize him. For the legislature, inside Venezuela, Maduro's opponents controlled just one major state body, the National Assembly, whose powers Maduro's rival Natural Constituent Assembly seized in 2017. Canada's Trudeau announces $53 million in aid to Venezuelans as Canada hosts an urgent meeting of the Lima Group on the Venezuelan crisis in Ottawa. Today, Canada is stepping up and announcing $53 million to address the most pressing needs of Venezuelans on the ground, including the almost 3 million refugees. According to a statement, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau spoke Sunday with Venezuelan opposition leader Juan Guiado, praising the courage and leadership of the National Assembly head whom Ottawa recognizes as interim president. The phone call comes a day before a meeting of the 14-nation Lima Group, made up of Canada and Latin American countries in Ottawa. Eleven of its members have recognized Guiado. A readout of the call from Trudeau's office said the two leaders discussed the importance of the international community, sending a clear message regarding the illegitimacy of the Maduro regime and the need to respect Venezuelan constitution. Both underscored the importance that free and fair presidential elections be held. The Prime Minister commended Juan Guiado for his courage and leadership in helping to return democracy to Venezuela and offered Canada's continued support. Trudeau added that the Lima Group meeting will consider how the international community can further support the people of Venezuela, including thorough immediate humanitarian assistance. Venezuela is in the midst of a power struggle that began on January 21st when a group of soldiers took control of a command post north of Caracas and released a video rejecting the legitimacy of President Nicolas Maduro, who won a second term last May in elections deemed fraudulent by the opposition and many in the international community. Two days later, Guiado stunned the world by proclaiming himself acting president, pledging a transitional government and free elections. The opposition's support has been stoked by the parlous state of the economy. Venezuela, once the richest country in Latin America, thanks to its oil revenues, is facing severe shortages of food and medicine, as well as runaway inflation. In addition to Canada, the United States, France, Germany, Spain, the Netherlands, Portugal and Britain and many Latin American countries, including Colombia and Brazil, have declared support for Guiado. On the other hand, Russia, China, Turkey and Iran support their ally Maduro. Mexican officials announce a plan to start searching for the 40,000 missing people that have disappeared in the country. Estima que actualmente existen 40,000 personas desaparecidas más de 1,100 fosas clandestinas, 
alrededor 26, de 26 mil cuerpos sin identificar en los servicios forenses, ya se da cuenta de la magnitud de la crisis humanitaria y de violación a los derechos humanos que estamos enfrentando y que debemos superar en nuestro país. Coming up, an eyewitness recalls the car bombing in the Somali market. Montargis residents explain their frustrations. The United Nations says the European Union can win big in the U.S.-China trade war. Eagle News, Washington, D.C. will be right back. Welcome back. You are watching Eagle News, Washington, D.C. An eyewitness tells his experience of a Mogadishu car bomb attack near a mall in a busy market that left at least nine people dead and several wounded. Somalia's Al Shabaab militants on Monday shot dead the Maltese manager of a port while detonating a car bomb in the capital which killed nine people and wounded several others. In a deadly day for the rest of nation, a gunman shot Maltese national Paul Anthony Formosa, manager of the port of Basasso, in semi-autonomous Puntland state for P&O Ports, a subsidiary of the Dubai-based DP World. Shortly thereafter, a powerful explosion for a car bomb rocked the busy Hamarwaini market in the capital Mogadishu, killing nine people in the latest attack from the Al-Qaeda affiliate plaguing the country. The Dubai government confirmed the death in a statement on Twitter and said the circumstances of the incident are being investigated. The statement read, three other employees have been injured in this morning's incident and all are currently receiving medical treatment. The attack was claimed by Al-Shabaab, which said in a statement it was part of a broader operations targeting the mercenary companies that loot the Somali resources. The DP World subsidiary, in 2017, signed a 30-year concession contract for the management and development of the port, strategically located on the Gulf of Aden, between the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, more than 800 miles north of Mogadishu. The Dubai-based ports company has sparked friction with Mogadishu over its development of ports in Berbera, in breakaway Somaliland, whose independence is not recognized, as well as Puntland. Many of Somalia's federal states have aligned with the United Arab Emirates, while the central government is perceived as pro-Qatar in the Gulf crisis pitting Arab powers against each other. One hour south, by Paris, by train, the town of Montargis is emblematic of the many problems the Yellow Vest movement has raised. It is deindustrialized, has high unemployment, has a lack of medical facilities and poor transport links. The area has been held its first public meeting as part of the National Great Debate, but local residents say it has done little to allay their fears and frustrations with the government. Les gens qui avaient déjà des tas de gens qui étaient à bout, qu'on avait assez, et qui avaient peut-être mis beaucoup d'espoir dans la dernière élection présidentielle en élisant un, un président beaucoup plus jeune, qui n'avait pas trop de partis politiques et qui prétendait vraiment terriblement changer les choses et puis finalement qui n'a pas changé énormément de choses et qui s'est rangé un peu du côté des élites et franchement ça ça je crois a déçu beaucoup de gens qui ont été alors c'est un territoire dont je ne dirais pas qu'il est délaissé mais c'est un territoire indubitablement qui est à la périphérie de l'île de France ce qu'on appelle les, les, la, la grande banlieue parisienne et donc euh, on, on a effectivement des gens qui réclament euh, tous les services de la région parisienne alors qu'on est à la frontière de la région parisienne il y a 27 ans À un moment donné, il faut arrêter de nous prendre pour des imbéciles. Euh, c'est trop tard pour la désinformation. Euh, on s'est réveillé, on est dans la rue, on est aussi dans des groupes de travail partout, que ce soit dans les zones rurales euh, et autres, on est vraiment partout. Et ça ne s'arrêtera que quand on aura gagné nos combats et qu'on aura une vraie représentativité vis-à-vis -vis de nos futurs élus. An hour south of Paris, in the town of Montargis, Yellow Vest demonstrators such as Isha Duchesne have no intention of stopping their 12-week protest against President Emmanuel Macron or being drawn into his great national debate. After a roundabout in the south of town, where violent protests have taken place since November, 
the 57-year-old factory worker dismissed the government's two-month debate, which has seen dozens of town hall meetings held since the middle of January. It's a charge made by many of Macron's opponents, who see the debate as a tactic to distract attention from the Yellow Vest movement, which has roiled the country and caused the biggest crisis of Macron's 20-month presidency. Announced in December, the national debate has so far provided both an outlet for angry voters to air their grievances and a stage on which Macron can perform ahead of the European Union Parliament elections in May. After months of plummeting approval ratings, the 40-year-old head of state has clawed back some lost ground in recent weeks, thanks to a series of public appearances that have sought to stress his more humble side. The number of yellow vests has also fallen sharply nationwide, with fewer and fewer roundabouts occupied, while the mass demonstrations held every last Saturday has dwindled in scale. Most observers agree that the crisis is likely to be a turning point in Macron's presidency, having highlighted the extent of anger among low-income families in rural and small-town France. Suggesting others could cash in instead, with the European Union possibly winning big, the UN said Monday neither protagonist in the US-China trade war stands to benefit from their standoff. In a report, the UN Conference on Trade and Development examined the repercussions of the tit-for-tat tariff already underway between the two trade giants, as well as the expected impact of a significant tariff hike scheduled to take effect on March 1st. The report titled The Trade Wars, The Pain and the Gain said that bilateral tariffs alter global competitiveness to the advantage of firms operating in countries not directly affected by them. It predicted that the European Union would be the biggest winner, taking home some $70 billion in additional trade thanks to the trade war. Last year, Beijing and Washington imposed tariffs on more than $360 billion in two-way trade after Trump initiated the trade war because of complaints over unfair trade practices. The two countries hailed progress in talks held in Washington last week aimed at avoiding an escalation of the conflict. But if no deal is reached by March 1st, U.S. duty rates on $200 billion in Chinese goods are due to rise 25% from 10%. The central message from this report is that the intended effect of the retaliatory tariffs imposed by the U.S. has not resulted in increased domestic production, but rather will lead to diversion of trade to third countries. If the tariffs rise to 25%, um, what will occur is simple. They will limit trade from China. However, it will not be effective in protecting domestic firms. So suppliers in the rest of the world will be more competitive. Trade diversion effects in favor of third countries. EU will capture 70 billion of the US-China trade. Japan, Mexico, and Canada will capture over 20 billion each. And perhaps the ultimate irony is that Mexico's capture of almost 27 billion US of the US-China trade will represent uh, the equivalent of about 6% of Mexico's exports. Um, perhaps it will help to build a wall. The study estimated that out of the $250 billion in Chinese exports subject to U.S. tariffs, some 80% would be captured by other firms in other countries, while 12% would be retained by Chinese firms, and only 6% would be captured by U.S. firms. The report said a similar scenario would apply to the $85 billion in U.S. exports hit by Chinese tariffs, estimating that 85% would go to companies in other countries, 10% would remain in the U.S., and only about 5% would go to Chinese firms. UNCTAD said countries that are expected to benefit the most from U.S.-China tensions are those which are more competitive and have economic capacity to replace U.S. and Chinese firms. The report indicated that the European Union stood to benefit the most, with companies in the bloc likely to capture about $50 billion of Chinese exports to the U.S. and about $20 billion of U.S. exports to China. The study found Japan, Mexico, and Canada would meanwhile each capture more than $20 billion in additional trade thanks to the tariff war. Australia, Brazil, India, Philippines, and Pakistan would also notice substantial effects relative to the size of their exports, it said. But the trade war will also have a number of negative effects on global trade, especially within certain markets. The UNCTAD study pointed to the soybean market, where the tit-for-tat tariffs have resulted in trade distortionary effects that have benefited Brazil especially, since the country has suddenly become the main soybean supplier to China. The UN agency said, but because of the magnitude and duration of the tariff is unclear, 
Brazilian producers have been reluctant to make investment decisions that may turn out to be unprofitable if the tariffs are revoked. It said Brazilian companies that purchase soybeans meanwhile stand to lose out amid inevitable price hikes. The study also said that positive effects for some countries will likely be outweighed by the negative global effects. A major concern, the report's authorities said, is the impact of trade disputes will have on still fragile global economies. They said this is especially a worry if the trade tensions spiral into currency wars, which would threaten the ability of people and companies around the world to pay off dollar-denominated debt. When we come back, the Church of Christ provides goods to impoverished and homeless individuals in Alberta. Eagle News, Washington, D.C. will return shortly. This is Eagle News, Washington, D.C., and I am Jennifer Polentan. Committed to help alleviate the situation of impoverished residents of Canada, the Church of Christ distributes goods to the homeless in Alberta. Thomas Likeness with the details. The demand never ends at Hope Mission, where the homeless and the hungry line up daily for a meal. The social agency traces its roots to North America's Great Depression. Hope Mission began in 1929 as a soup kitchen, offering meals to people in Edmonton who had no jobs and no place to live. Its work carries on today. Presently, there are about 2,000 people in the city classed as homeless. Many more live in poverty. At times, some have resorted to rummaging through dumpsters behind restaurants in search of something to eat. Various levels of government have attempted to help the poor with a variety of programs. But many people find themselves turning to non-governmental social agencies to help them with their needs. These agencies also receive support from the community. Recently, members of the Church of Christ set up tables loaded with food and clothing on the sidewalk outside Hope Mission to give away to those in need. Earlier in the day, church members packed the goods for distribution. Edmonton District Minister Voltaire Tamison says the church frequently conducts such campaigns. And this one is to show our concern to our fellow men and to our loved ones who need material things and not only material things that we are sharing to them, but most especially our faith inside the church. He adds the help is not limited to church members. Uh, actually, we share what we have not only to the members of the church, but also to our fellow men that uh, they need something uh, that can support their life. It's just after four in the afternoon and the doors to the soup kitchen have opened. People are filing in for their meal, and today they have been given something extra. For some, this act of kindness may be the first time in a long time they've experienced a stranger's caring. For those helping out, it's a chance to share their blessings and give back to the community. In Edmonton, Thomas I. Likeness, Eagle News, I'm one with 25. Thanks, Thomas. That is today's Eagle News, Washington, D.C. Join us tomorrow for stories that matter to you. Visit our websites at eaglenews.ph and eaglenewslive.com. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash eaglenewsph. Thank you for watching. I am Jennifer Polentan and I am one with 25.